Amen. Well, I hope that you all have had a good weekend so far. Uh, I don't know uh, about you, but I, I enjoy this time. I enjoy the 4th of July. Uh, but I know there are some, um, there is a, a group of uh, animals that don't like this month, I mean, not like, like this day. How many of y'all got dogs? Dogs don't like fireworks, do they? How many of y'all have dogs going crazy? Last several nights, uh, but uh, but but we get to we get to have a good um, good holiday weekend. I hope you've been able to enjoy it, and uh, and today we get to continue in our series through the book of First Peter, and uh, and we're going to see how the Lord has set us free. Amen. And uh, this this morning, if you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's word, we're going to read First Peter chapter two, and we'll read the first uh, ten verses. Peter writes, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious... You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands it's in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would begin speaking to our hearts and our minds, Lord, and just um, help us to see uh, the beauty of what Jesus has done and what he's done for us and who has made us to be and, and how he is shaping us and the expectation that we are to have in our life today. Lord, help us to be stones of sacrifice. Help us to be stones that, that praise you and, and lift you up and glorify your holy name. Lord, I, I ask that you help me to be a plain preacher today, so plain that a child could understand. I do realize that out of all the people in the room this morning, that there is strict judgment and rightly dividing your word of truth. And I accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So Saturday, July 4th, we celebrated. July 4th, 1776, the United States of America was birthed and the American people celebrated the independence of the tyranny from Great Britain. This would not have happened if it were not for men willing to die on the battlefield for our independence. Amen? It took the sacrifice of blood. It took the sacrifice of life for you and me to have our freedom and independence. Amen? And um, uh, America... Though it is not perfect, and I don't know if there's any government, that, well, I know that there will never be a government that's perfect on this earth. Uh, though, though she may not be perfect, I tell you, she's the land that I want to live in, and I'm glad and thankful that I live in the United States of America and that I am uh, an American citizen. I, I, I am thankful for that, right? Because what we have seen in our short life Y'all realize that America is not even 250 years old yet. Uh, 2026 will turn 250 years old. That's not long. And, uh, and, and, And we have seen tremendous things happen in the progress of those 250 years. And, uh, and though there's still a long way to go, 
God has used America to be a light to the nations. The gospel has been used here. People have experienced freedom here like they haven't in any other country. And so I'm thankful for that. But can I tell you about a greater freedom? Can I tell you about a greater liberty? Can I tell you about a sacrifice that was greater than the men who died on the battlefield? Can I tell you about a stone? A stone that was chosen, a stone that was precious, a stone that was the cornerstone, Peter said, that was laid down at the foundation of the world. That stone is Jesus who died for our sin, rose again, and on the day that he rose again, guess what? He birthed a nation that is eternal. He birthed a people that is forever. That anyone who is in Christ Jesus is changed forever and we're promised a home in heaven and there is a land coming that will never be destroyed. I'm glad and I thank God that I am part of his kingdom and I'm a part of his nation and that I'm a citizen citizen of heaven. What about you? So we get to celebrate that. Because here's the great thing about being a Christian is this. It doesn't matter what country you live in, you can still be a part of his kingdom. Amen? It crosses all tribes, tongues, and nations. And the Bible tells us whoever will call upon his name will be saved. Now, in Peter, he talks about this stone. We see that there in uh, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone that was rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. That's verse 4. Jesus was rejected by men, but he was chosen by God to bring salvation to all who would believe. Look, jump down to verse 6. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I'm laying uh, in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. That is a promise for us as believers, isn't it? That when Jesus returns, guess who is not ashamed? Guess who doesn't have to shrink back? Guess who doesn't have to be in fear? Guess who doesn't have to wonder where they stand with the holy God? His people. And so the honor is for you. That what Jesus did for us, he saved us, and he, and he, and he redeemed us, and he bought us, and he gives us a promise that in him we are good. In him we are safe. In him we have life. And that's to our benefit What Jesus did benefits who? It benefits us. It gives us a hope and a peace of everlasting life and happiness. But for those who do not believe, it is an offense. It's the stone that the builders rejected. It's a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. People, some people hear the same message of hope and redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness, and man, they can't stand that. They're offended by that. We, we have a lot of people in our nation that get offended by the gospel, right? You say, Jesus died for your sin. What do you mean, sin? I'm not a sinner. I mean, I might not be a perfect person, but I'm not that bad. Come on, pastor. No, the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We say, in Jesus, there's one way to salvation. Oh, that's narrow-minded, preacher. I can't believe that you would be so narrow-minded in a culture, in a world where we're more sophisticated than that. There has to be multiple ways to the Lord. But Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, the gospel is offensive to many, but to some, man, it's it's a message of hope. You mean I can be forgiven? You mean I can know God, the one who created me? He loves me. He provided a way for me to know him. He sent his son to die for me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And so for those who believe, man, it's good news. It's reassurance. It's confirmation. It's it's a promise that we can hold to. And when Jesus comes, we'll not shrink back. We'll not be ashamed. Because why? Because we have found 
our liberty and freedom and forgiveness in the stone of Jesus Christ. He was the stone of sacrifice. He laid his life down so that we might live. He gave up his life so that we could be set free. We have been set free by Jesus. And because of that, because of what Jesus has done, because he's called us into his kingdom, he has made us stones of sacrifice. The stone of sacrifice, Jesus, now is making us into stones of sacrifice. We are a spiritual house, he says. And each one of us, we are a stone in the house of God that he is building up. Therefore, we are to put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all of the things that are ungodly, all of the things that are unholy. Look at verse 1. Let's go back to verse 1 of First Peter 2. So put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, and envy and slander. Put all that away. Why? Because now you're the people of God. You have a new way to live. And he says, here's what you need to do. You need to long for the spiritual milk of the word of God. Long for. That word means crave. Have you ever craved something? Okay, let me, let me ask you this. Have you ever been hungry and you've been really hungry? I mean, you just, you craved a certain, maybe it was a certain dessert. Maybe it was a certain meal. Uh, you, you just, man, you just, how have you all been, cra- you've craved something. Come on now, every one of us, you know. Uh, you've, you've craved glazed donuts. Whew, man. Aren't those from the devil? I mean, (laughs) they're so good, but yet so bad for you, you know? Um, And they talk to you, don't they? Hey, hey, Grant, I'm over here. And you get this craving, man, you you get this craving. And you you gotta have it. Peter says, you need to have a craving for the word of God. You gotta have a craving to read God's word, to hear God's word, to know it, to study it. Like, I gotta have it. Like, I need it. It, it, I, I, I need it because I know that it's my nourishment. I know that it's where I grow. I know that I need it. Like, a newborn needs that milk to grow healthy and develop strong. The Christian needs God's word in order. To grow strong. Amen? And so he says that we need to crave for or long for this spiritual milk that that we can grow up in our salvation, that that we can become mature. He puts a little condition on here. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Uh, Peter does this a few times in this letter. Uh, Not that he wants us to doubt our salvation, but he also wants us to check to make sure, right? Because here's the sad reality, is that there are a lot of lost church people. There are a lot of people that signed a card, repeated a prayer, went through the baptistry, and never had a conversion experience. They They have a religious experience, but they don't have a true conversion coming to Christ experience. If you have tasted that the Lord is good, then here's how your life ought to be, right? And a Christian, a true born-again believer, has indeed tasted that the Lord is good. Amen? You know that he's sweet. You know that what he's done for you is good. You know that you've been a sinner and God by his grace saves you out of that sin and he transformed your life. And man, you have a life of gratitude, of thankfulness, of grace and mercy flow out of you. Why? Because of what he's done for you. Peter, I think, is quoting and using some of Psalm 34 in this in this. Uh, first couple verses here in First Peter 2. In Psalm 34, verse 8, the psalmist says this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no 
lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? The answer to that is rhetorical. It should be everybody. Everybody should want that. Well, here's what you do. Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do what? Good. Speak, seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. How many of y'all have experienced the goodness of God in the midst of suffering and pain and heartache? The Lord is good. You've experienced the goodness of the Lord in, in good times, in the seasons when things were, all, were going well. The Lord is good. We praise the Lord because his hand is upon his children forever. In every season of life. And there's moments in our life when we, we think, there's no way I'm going to get through this. But somehow we do. How does that happen? The grace of God. Why? Because, man, he is so good. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us. No, we are his children and we are in his family. And he has created us to be his people he is the stone that the builders rejected. He is the stone of sacrifice that gave us life. And now he calls us to be stones of sacrifice for his glory. Let's continue to look at what, what he says. Look at verse 5. Let's go back to verse 5. You yourselves, so Peter's now talking to believers, right? He's talking to you. You know, just, just every once in a while as a Christian, you've got to talk to yourself, right? It doesn't make you crazy. It just, you know, you just... You got to say, he's talking to me. So go ahead and just tell yourself. Say, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. If you're a believer, he's talking to me. So you yourselves, he's talking to you, believer. He's talking to you, child of God. You yourselves, like living stones, are what? Are being built up as a spiritual house. That is an ongoing process. An active process. You are being built up. You are in process. We are, we are growing. We are, we are moving forward in our walk with Christ, right? We are being built up as a spiritual house. Why? Two reasons. One, to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices accept, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, now let's break this down for a moment. This is where the stones of sacrifice comes in. If you are a Christian, you are to be a stone of sacrifice. Why? Because you are a stone in the house of God that's being built up together. We're all collectively a part of, the, a part of God's, God's house, right? You individually is just... Not the whole house of God. We together make up the house of God, right? And he's building his church. And he's using you to glorify his holy name. And the way he wants to use you as a priest of God. Okay? You are a chosen race. A holy nation. A royal priesthood. So in the Old Testament, the priesthood was established. In the Old Testament, only the men who were in the tribe of Levi could be a priest. And so when Moses was given the law and he set apart Aaron as the high priest and he anointed the priest from the Levitical priesthood, he, he, he makes a sacrifice and he takes the blood of that animal and he puts it on the right earlobe. 
And he applies the blood to the right thumb. And he applies the blood to the right toe. And he is consecrating that individual for the service of God's work. That they would dedicate their life to fully serving and following and carrying out sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. When Jesus came, he came as the ultimate sacrifice, right? Those were shadows, foreshadowing. They were types and shadows of something greater to come. All the sacrifices that the priest made was pointing to the ultimate sacrifice who would be who? Jesus. And he is the Passover lamb. He is the sacrificial lamb. He is the one that made atonement for us. When he died, he split the curtain that separated men, the holy of holies. The curtain was ripped from top to bottom. And he opened a way for everyone who would call upon his great name could now have a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Therefore, all of us who are God's children are to be priests of God. We're a holy priesthood. And so as a holy priesthood, we have been marked by the blood of a lamb. We have had the blood of Jesus applied to our life. It's as if the blood of Jesus has been applied to our right ear, to our right thumb, to our right toe, the right ear. All of our faculties, all of our mental faculties need to be sanctified under the blood. Amen? Our mouth needs to be, we need to have the blood applied to our mouth so that we speak that which we should. Amen? Our ears need to be sanctified by the blood that, that only certain things need to come into our, to our ears, Right? We don't need to be listening to everything. We need to be able to be discerning. We need to be able to say, this is truth, this is error. Our minds need to be transformed by the blood of Christ. Everything about us, the blood's been applied to. I've been set apart. My mind's been set apart. My eyes have been set apart. My ears have been set apart. You get it? My thumb, my hands, my activities, my actions, what I do in life, everything I do, the blood's applied to it. So therefore, everywhere I go, I am a priest. I just don't show up on Sunday morning and put on the robes of a priest. You just don't show up on Sunday morning and say, okay, now I'm a priest of God. No. If you are a child of God, you wear those royal clothes every single day. You have been given a new, new, ward, new wardrobe in Christ Jesus. Amen? You've been getting a new set of clothes. Priestly clothes. And everywhere you go, you serve as a priest of God. So that means your job is sanctified. Your home is sanctified. Your friendships need to be sanctified. Everything that you do has to be, the blood has to be applied to that. Does that make sense? And so when I go places, I go as a priest of God. I am a stone of sacrifice. My feet, the path I travel, needs to be sanctified and holy. We don't need to let our feet walk down ungodly paths, do we? Our feet needs to be fixed and straight and set on the path that God set out for us. We need to walk in his ways, not our ways. And so we have been set apart. We have been called. We are living stones being built up, put together. We're growing to be a spiritual house, offering spiritual sacrifices, right? Offering, it's what he says, offering spiritual sacrifices, Unto God, acceptable to Him. So, what are some sacrifices that we make? We don't kill animals anymore, right? Because there's one sacrifice that is sufficient for all mankind. So, as priests, we don't make sacrifices on behalf of our sin. Jesus did that. But we make sacrifices acceptable to God, pleasing to God, through Jesus. Everything we do is through the Son. The way we glorify the Father is to honor the Son. The way that we pray to the Father is through the Son, right? Access to the throne of God the Father is through 
his son, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And so therefore, we offer spiritual sacrifices. Well, here are some sacrifices the Bible says that we can make. You ready? Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. One sacrifice you can make every day is to be broken, to humble yourself, to go before God and acknowledge your need for him. Because here's the truth. We don't just need the Lord's help for salvation. We need the Lord's help for sanctification, for everyday living, everyday life. We need the Lord's help for our marriage. We need the Lord's help for our uh, parenting. We need the Lord's help for our career. We need the Lord every single day, right? And so one sacrifice we can make is in the morning, before we even start our day, is to acknowledge our dependence upon God. Lord, without you, I'm nothing. Lord, I need you today. Direct me. Guard over me. Protect me. Give me wisdom, discernment. And you seek the Lord. You have a broken. And when you do commit offense against God, that you admit it and repent of your sin. Confess your sin. God, I messed up. A broken spirit is a humble spirit. One who's seeking the Lord. Another sacrifice that we can make as, as stones of sacrifice is our bodies. Our bodies is to be what? A living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Our bodies are offered as a, as a sacrifice unto God. Lord, you saved me. You have my life. Whatever you want me to do, that's what, that's what I want to do. Wherever you want me to go, that's where I want to go. What you want me to say, that's what I want to say. I, just use my life for your purpose and your glory. Uh, if, if, if you've already died to yourself, 